Hi, Woodruff families. We are going to be reading chapter 9 of the book Unplugged. This is Tyrell that's, that's speaking. It's an insect the size of a small jeep. They call them palmetto bugs down here, but back home in Pennsylvania, they're just plain roaches. There's nothing just plain about this guy, though. If there's a Guinness Book of Roach Records, he belongs on the cover. I nudged Jet, who's half asleep on the pool recliner beside me. Ugh, leave me alone, he mumbles. I'm in a better place. Like there could be a worse one. You've got to see this, I insist. He opens one eye and follows my pointing finger to the giant bug which is marching across the pool deck like it's like it owns the place. Wow, he muses. Where I come from, anything that big would get its own exhibit in the San Diego Zoo. Or, I counter, it could feed a small lizard for a week and a half. Isn't it just our luck that Needles turns out to be a carnivore? He only eats meat, the one thing you can't get here at the Oasis. That leaves just bugs. Their meat, in a gross kind of way. Jet spills out the contents of his water cup and gets up beside me. We stalk the palmetto bug for a few steps. Jet drops to his knees and places the cup gently over it. We exchange a fist bump. Yeah! Needles isn't going to starve anytime soon. After this meal, he might even have a weight problem. We've barely finished congratulating ourselves on our hunting skills when the cup begins to move. It scrapes along the apron of the pool as the big bug struggles for freedom. We follow in amazement, unsure of what to do, but unwilling to lose our prey. And then a pair of bare feet steps protectively around the fugitive cup. We look up to see Grace standing over us. What are you doing? Needles, dinner is in that cup, I exclaim. And breakfast and lunch, Jet adds. And maybe the catering for his bar mitzvah. We don't kill at the Oasis, she lectures. That's how Magnus first came to vegetarianism, with the belief that all life is precious. Yeah, but what about Needles' life, I argue. He can only eat things that used to be alive. There are plenty of dead insects around, she reasons. They only live a few days, but we're not killing anything. Fair enough. Jet reaches out a foot and stomps the paper cup flat. Oops. With his toe, he flips the cup away, revealing the crushed bug underneath. The crushed palmetto bug underneath. Oh, well, what do you know? Dead insect. He scoops up the carcass with the flattened cup. Needles, this is your lucky day. Grace has a few thousand things to say about that. She calls Jet every insult in the book, and even a few I haven't heard before. But I think Jet did the right thing. What are we supposed to do? Scour the whole property for fruit flies that died of old age and ants that got stepped on by mistake? It was the right thing for us, and definitely the right thing for needles. It, didn't, it just didn't turn out so great for the palmetto bug. Jet weathers the storm without flinching. I guess he's pretty used to getting yelled at. If you're done, he says finally, I've got a starving lizard to feed. I'll go with you, I decide. Wait up, Grace orders, running for her towel. I thought you didn't believe in bug killing, Jet reminds her. Well, it's dead now, she shoots back. Your violence might as well serve some purpose. They argue all the way to the shed. Needles may be a cute little guy, but I have to say that watching him dismantle that giant insect is the most nauseating experience I've ever had. Even Jet has to turn away. Only Grace has the stomach to watch the whole disgusting thing. It's the miracle of nature, she proclaims with love in her voice. His feast complete, the lizard splashes back into the paint tray and resumes his usual position, standing stock still with only his eyes and nostrils out of the water. I once read that for every human on earth, there are over 200 million insects. So you'd think it would be pretty easy to find dead bugs to feed needles. Nope. 
Turns out, we've got the healthiest bugs on the whole planet right here, thanks to Magnus and his philosophy about the sanctity of all life, even the gross kind. There are no bug zappers, no roach motels, not even a fly swatter on the whole property. If a mosquito wants your blood, you're his for the taking. Trust me, I speak from experience. I'm allergic to mosquito antibodies, so when I get a bite, it swells to the size of a major league pictures bound. I step in through the screen door onto the wood floor of the welcome center. In addition to the place where you have to surrender all electronics, this is also where you go to pick up your snail mail. Here at the Oasis, that's the only way to keep in touch with the outside world. The mail desk is usually manned by one of the buddies, or sometimes Janelle, when it's too rainy for water sports. But this afternoon, I'm surprised to see Magnus himself standing there, his smile almost as bright as his highlighter yellow warm-up suit. Behold, Tyrell, he greets me. Behold, I mumble. Unlike Grace, I'm never totally relaxed chit-chatting with the Oasis bigwigs, Magnus and Ivory. They look at you too hard, like they can read your mind. Nowadays, my mind can't withstand inspection. It knows too much about a certain lizard hidden away in the corner of the property. Magnus pulls a stack of mail from a cubby hole and drops it in my arms. It's mostly magazines for mom and dad, Nutrition Weekly, Eat Yourself Slim, and Dieter's Digest. There's also a letter for Sarah from Landon Almighty. I feel like flushing it down the nearest toilet. Except that hearing from Landon is the only thing that makes Sarah semi-human. How unfair is that? I can't even, I can't take revenge on her for being mean because that will only make her meaner. Magnus holds one more envelope. It's for Jet, he explains. If you wouldn't mind passing it along, I've noticed you two are becoming good friends. Really? He smiles that all-knowing smile of his. Perhaps you can help him see the positive transformation the Oasis has to offer. Ugh, right. I feel my face twisting into what's probably a goofy grin. Me? Good friends with Vladimir Baranov's son? I mean, sure, I get along with him better than, let's say, like Grace or Brooklyn do. He only spends time with those two because of needles. But still, I find myself standing a little taller now. The Oasis founder hands me an airmail letter. The return address is orthodontist without borders, so it must be from Jet's mother. There's a colorful stamp on the corner with butterflies on it. The cancellation reads, Burkina Faso. Thanks. Uh, a lot. I can't bring myself to call him Magnus. I've got so much Jet on the brain that it might come out Nimbus. How would I ever explain that? I exit the welcome center and head straight across the property for Cottage 29, walking so fast I'm almost running. Jet and I get along well, but we don't really hang out together like friends. Delivering this letter is a reason to knock on his door. It could even be an excuse to hang out. It takes a long time for him to answer, but when he finally opens the door and sees me there, a look of concern appears on his face. What's wrong? Is everything okay with the lizard? No, no, no. Needles is fine. I hold out the envelope from Burkina Faso. I was just at the welcome center. This came in the mail for you. I think it's from your mom. He unfolds the letter and begins to read, leaving me standard, standing awkwardly on the welcome mat. Is your mom all right? Fine, he replies absently without looking up. The usual stuff. Palette expanders in Pakistan, braces in Bolivia, retainers in Rwanda... Wow, she sure travels a lot, I comment. You think of Jet's dad as the famous one, but his mother is just as accomplished in her own way. She's a major globetrotter. You've got a lot of mail, he points out, indicating the stack in my arms. Meh, I shrug. My parents die at magazines, and a love letter from my sister's boyfriend. Jet seems interested. A love letter? I nod. They come every day, sometimes two or three. It's the only thing that keeps Sarah off my back. What does the guy write? He asked. How should I know? She doesn't show it to me. Love stuff, I guess. He plucks Sarah's letter from the pile and holds it up to the light. 
we should read it. It could be very instructive. Are you crazy? It'll be destructive when Sarah sees I've opened her letter. She'll cut my head off and use it as a soccer ball. She'll never know, Jet explains reasonably. We'll steam open the envelope and glue it shut again. I feel myself turning pale. Where are we going to get steam at the oasis? He beams. <laughs> are you kidding me? We've got the greatest natural source of steam right here. The next thing you know, we're standing at the edge of the bath, holding Sarah's letter over the rising vapors. As the envelope slowly steams, Jet works at it with a butter knife from the dining hall. The adhesive melts away and he gently opens the flap with such a light touch that I suspect this is not his first rodeo. Once the letter's out, we sneak back to Cottage 29 and spread the page on the kitchen table between us to see what we've got. Wait a minute, I exclaim. Is this in code? It says, Dear Sarah, at the top, and there are a handful of real words sprinkled here and there, but the rest of it is made up of clusters of numbers and letters that don't seem to mean anything. Jet, of course, understands perfectly. Fuego put out a guide for this last year, he explains. Like here, I-O-Y-4-E-A-E. That means I love you forever and ever. And here, D O R B S G F, adorable girlfriend. And it says C R Z because it makes him crazy that they can't be together. He signs off with a dinosaur hug, D H U. I'm stunned. Is Sarah going to be able to understand this? Of course. These two probably spend all day texting each other. They can't do that while she's here, so he writes these letters in the same way. She'll understand perfectly, except maybe this. Before my horrified eyes, he takes a pen and writes YBHYG in the margin. What did you do that for? She's gonna, I wail, she's going to kill me. Relax, he soothes. She won't know. It looks no different than what Landon wrote. My racing heart slows a little. Jet's right. It would be hard to match the handwriting, but the capital letters just look like, look just like the others. And black ink is black ink. I'm interested in spite of myself. Does it mean anything? Definitely, he assures me. It means your brother hates your guts. I'm speechless for a moment, then give me that pen. At the bottom next to Landon's signature, I add B-H-O-F, Bonehead Hall of Fame, I explain. Now you're getting it, Jet approves. One more. In the body of the letter, in a spot where Landon left a lot of space, he inserts QJ5, the at symbol, Z2. What does that stand for? Absolutely nothing, he says proudly, and while she's trying to figure it out, she won't have time to bother you. He refolds the paper, slides it back into the envelope, and moistens the flap. It seals perfectly. I expect a full report, he says when he hands it to me. Thanks, I tell him. I think. My sister spends the rest of the day with that letter, a perplexed frown on her face. She's definitely not happy, but she isn't mean to me. Not even once. Jet Baranov might be an even bigger genius than his dad. Meanwhile, the quest to find food for needles in the dining hall grinds to a halt. Even the high-protein meat substitutes, like seitan, tofu, lentils, and chia seeds, get no love from the lizard. He looks at us sort of reproachfully, as if to say, you can do better than that. I'm in the shed with Jet, Grace, and Brooklyn. The four of us have emerged as Team Lizard. I don't understand why he won't eat the soy burger, Grace complains. The vegetarian patties at the Oasis are world-renowned. Brooklyn says, ah, He's a carnivore. He knows what's meat and what isn't. If I had my phone, says Jet, I'd call that barbecue place in Hedgeapple and order up something that would knock his little socks off. A gloomy silence settles in the shed. Brooklyn is the first to speak up. You know... She begins slowly. Hedge Apple is only a couple of miles upriver. What difference does that make? I ask. With no phone or internet, the next town might as well be on the moon. Well, she seems to be dragging the words out herself. 
the oasis has a boat pedal boat and canoes jet retorts no thank you i shake my head i think she means the other boat remember the motor launch the pathfinders used to rescue us when we crashed the pedal one they keep it at a separate dock just around a bend in the saline brooklyn explains you can't see it from the center because it's hidden by trees. Jet's eyes narrow at her. Seems to me that you always know an awful lot about what goes on behind the scenes around here. Brooklyn shrugs. I don't go for a lot of Oasis stuff, so I've got time to wander around and scope things out. Like what? Jet probes suspiciously. Like where things are. The boat, the shed, the place they store the bags of fertilizer for the grass. I know the buddies have a nightly poker game, and the ivory sometimes takes five-hour bike rides. I know Janelle is training for an Ironman, and Magnus has to wear special shoes because his feet aren't exactly the same size. What's so terrible about the Oasis activities? Grace demands. People travel from all around the world for the chance to be here. Nothing personal, Brooklyn says honestly. This place just, is, just isn't me. At all. I should know. I've been coming longer than any of you guys, and I know you guys think I'm weird. <gasps> That's not true, Grace interjects automatically. Brooklyn isn't fooled. It's fine, she reassures us. Sometimes I think I'm weird too. For the record, I don't think Brooklyn's weird at all. In fact, after Jet, she's becoming the kid at the o Oasis I admire the most. How are we supposed to swipe this boat and take it to Hedge Apple without the Pathfinders catching us? Jet asks with interest. In the gap between meditation and dinner, Brooklyn replies readily, that's the longest space of time when we're on our own. A couple of us could jump in the launch, head to hedge apple, buy meat, and be back before anyone notices we're missing. Grace looks worried. I don't know about that. It's one thing to break the rules by keeping needles, but taking a boat that isn't ours, leaving the center without permission... Jet has a simple answer to that. So don't come. I'm going. If I don't get to breathe a little non-oasis air very soon, my head is going to blast off my body and take out a passing satellite. I'm going too, I announced bravely. I'm not totally comfortable with the idea of going AWOL by stealing the oasis's own motor launch. But I always take the safe route. And where does it ever get me? Maybe I haven't got the guts to stand up to Sarah or Mom and Dad, but this time I'll take a stand for needles. If Jet and Brooklyn think this can work, I'm on board. Brooklyn senses my nervousness. I don't think we're going to get caught, she reassures me. Grace can spread the word that we're hiking in the woods. No one will look for us until dinner, and we'll be back before then. Oh no. I'm going with you guys, Grace says, slanting a stink eye in Jet's direction. There's no way I'm leaving Needle's health in his hands. He'll wreck the boat. It wouldn't be the first time. Don't I know it.